So first of all, thanks to the organizer for giving me the opportunity to present the work here. Uh, yes. Uh, well, the, the work is about capacitive couplings, the persistent current qubits. I'm coming from the University of Salamanca. Salamanca, this is a very old institution, 800 years old. I think that is competing with one of the oldest here as Bologna. And it is in a, in a nice city, so if you are around the center of Spain, come and visit. And if you do, come and visit also the lab. Hi, hi, maybe because uh, you cannot hear me. Hi, I'm so very. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi. Yeah. I will try to speak louder. I think that is my problem also that I speak very soft. Uh, yes. And before staying in, uh, coming to University of Salamanca, I was in Madrid in the group of Quantum Information and Foundation, led by Juan Jose Garcia Ripoll. And actually, this work has been done in collaboration with him and with other PhD students in the project, especially Maria Ita. Make, oh, epa almost all the work. And all of this is part of a wider project that is the Abacus project that wants to build a, quantum, a coherent quantum annealer in, in Barcelona. And it, this project is coordinated by Paul Fordier. Okay, so once we have said that, I want to give a bit of motivation why I'm going to go through all these travels. And the motivation is that we want to improve the quantum technologies using superconducting circuit. I think that everyone would like to do this. And the quantum technologies that we are going to, that we would like to improve is quantum computer, because as I said, this work is part of the Abacus project. So the quantum computer is this gate model. You have this gate model here, and it's based on applying gates to the qubit, to two qubit gates. And you have another model that is this aliabatic quantum computing. Yeah. It doesn't work. Oh. Well, usually with my mobile, when I shake it, it works. But with this, it doesn't work. Well, it doesn't matter. Uh, and it, this is based on a slow evolution of, a, uh, of the Hamiltonian of your system that you have a high control over it. So you go from a, uh, a ground state that it is easy to prepare to a one that is more difficult to prepare, but uh, still it has the computation, uh, the, it solved the computational problem that you want to get. So uh, this means there are also quantum simulation, that the word that I'm going to say also applies to this quantum simulation, and this is made by many groups. So in principle, these two models are equivalent. This is something that probably you all know. Uh, this is from a theoretical point of view, maybe from a practical boy point of view is not so much equivalent, but anyway, all of them require to engineer good qubit coupling and to have good qubit, uh, good qubit coherence. At some point, you have to sacrifice one of the prop of this requirement to get another one from time to time. For example, I think that here in this, in the, well, in this computer that is the deep wave last uh, quantum processor, this is an annealer, it is not universal, but uh, still it falls in the adiabatic quantum computer. So what they do is they put a lot of qubits. Those qubits are, are very connected. So this green, uh, this green uh, stuff is one qubit that is coupled to 12 or more qubits. But at some point, I think that you sacrifice a bit the qubit coherence. Here, the lattice, this is from the IBM quantum processor, the Washington, you have a lattice that is less connected. Uh, there are less qubits but you have, I think, that a better coherence for individual qubits. So in the talk, what I'm going to focus is in these qubit couplings. We want to improve it. And what we want to do is to get uh, ways of finding more qubit couplings so we can wider the families of models that we can, uh, we can uh, implement in a quantum adiabatic computing. Uh, but at some point, I would talk uh, about qubit co coherence because the, from time to time we would have to sacrifice a bit the qubit coherence for the qubit coupling, as I said. Okay, uh, as an example of what we want to do. Uh, for example, for adiabatic quantum computer, I said that it is equivalent to the gate model of quantum computer, and this equivalence can be taken at least theoretically 
uh, to this model. If you are able, for example, to get this model in a quantum adiabatic computer, you would be able, at least theoretically, to solve uh, any, any problem that a, a universal quantum computer can solve. Uh, but the matter is that this model is very difficult to implement in a quantum annealer or in, or in a quantum adiabatic computer in a superconducting circuit because you have to get full tunability of all the parameters, like the gap of the qubit, the coupling uh, of all the qubit, not just two, and you have to have two, two direction of coupling. Now this is difficult. So from time to time, you may be uh, likely to get something simpler, and for this reason, they were looking for non-stochastic model that maybe uh, you, what you want to do is to implement something that is not so complicated as this, but uh, still you can warranty in some way that you are going to gain something uh, respect uh, classical computer. And what is this? This is non-stochastic model, quantum model. So those quantum models exhibit a same problem and then you cannot do the computation with, a, uh, with a, uh, Monte Carlo. Then you delete Monte Carlo as quantum Monte Carlo as a direct competitor of your quantum annealer or your quantum adiabatic computer. So this non-stochastic model were realized by the people of D-Way uh, a couple of years ago, and here these shaded regions, the region of parameters, well, this is the coupling, GYY, that is there, well, GYY is not there, anyway, GYY, GXX, GZZ, and this is the, the strength of the coupling in gigahertz. The gap is larger, and this is an important point, and in these regions, you get non-stochastic model, and here, non-stochastic model. However, this came to be a bit strange because in these two papers, they show that even if you are here and you are non-stochastic, what could happen is that you can cure the non-stochasticity by doing a quantum, simul a quantum Monte Carlo on the full superconducting circuit. At least, they s in this paper, they show that they can do it uh, very, very explicitly in a perturbative regime and non-stochastic model. So, what we are going to, for example, our direction of work is to try to show that we can break these results, well, not break, but see how you can go with the, together with this result in superconducting uh, three Joseph conjunction qubits. And for this, we are going to try to uh, implement a model like this we are not going to make it, but we are going to make something uh, similar to this, and also try to explore the uh, different regime than the perturbative one. Okay. So this is the outline of the talk. We are going to study uh, in the first part three Josephson junction qubits coupled to other qubits and to L re LC resonators. Yes. Uh, for this, well, we are going to show for this that there are two directions that we can couple ultra strongly. And for this, for two qubit qubit, we are going to show that we are able to couple ultra strongly, not in two directions, not this is not completely true, but almost in two directions. And for this, and then in the second part, we are going to couple a fluxonium filter to a waveguide and also see uh, that it gives an interesting model which give you quite protected states from decay. Okay. Let's go with the first part. So we have this persistent current qubits. This is a, you all know, this is a loop with a Josephson junction, and here we can, we put two Josephson junction for the three Josephson junction qubits, but in general for a persistent current qubit, what you are going to have is a potential like this, so you have the left and right, they, uh, they are persistent current with different direction. You have the qubit gap there, and what you do, well, and let me see a, a very easy example of how to induce magnetic interaction, the simple one. So you write this model, this is the tunneling, from going from here to here, and then you can couple with the intensity to an external flux. What you do is you project this operator in the qubit base, and you get E sigma x, and now if you want to couple another qubit, you see that this external field can be induced by, by a mutual inductance by the other qubit, and then you have here another current operator that you also projected in the qubit base, and you have these two. Okay? So uh, for this, in fact, if you want to get, uh, you have this model, and now can we go to ultra strong coupling system? Yes. What you have to do is, for example, to get the interaction strong, so the, the mutual interaction is strong, and also large. Uh, persistent current, fine, and this was done in this 
to paper, but even they put the resonator, the qubits, together with the resonator, galvanically coupled. And in this one, it was also the case. Fine. Uh, now, going for the uh, capacitive coupling. We have, for the capacitive coupling, we are going to have like this one for two qubits. We join it with a capacitor and we have charger. Fine. We do the same trick. We project the charge in the qubit base and we have a sigma y model, a sigma y operator. If we put a resonator, we are going to have the standard form with the impedance here. And uh, yeah, fine. Then it is straightforward to find the coupling. The coupling, it is in the y, y direction and it is going to be, if you, you are going to have two because you are putting two qubits, if they are similar, you are going to have two gaps here. And then what you find is that the coupling divided by the gap depends on the gap also. For the qubit resonator, it's different. The coupling divided by the gap, it doesn't depend on the gap, which is much better. Why is much better? Because if you have something like this, it was discussed for a similar system, not for this one, in this paper of Herman, a couple of years ago also, that uh, this is, you cannot use, for example, this limits a lot of the coupling that you can get. And for instance, you cannot get a, uh, something to do, to do something like quantum annealing. Why? Quantum annealing, at the beginning, you have a large gap, and then you decrease the gap up to zero, theoretically, and then you have a large interaction. Okay, but this is very difficult because you decrease the gap and then you have your coupling divided by the gap that goes to zero. So this is not good. For the qubit resonator, it's not that bad because, well, at least this restriction is not there because you don't have here nothing like the, the gap. And this is going to be easier to deal with. But anyway, so, but this, this project, there is, is there something that we are missing here? Uh, is this projection on the qubit base fine? Well, it is not so, so much. Why? Because this projection, if you look, uh, is just the first step when you have the effective, you have the full superconducting qubit Hamiltonian. You have to somehow to project it to the qubit base. But the first step in this projection, the effective uh, Hamiltonian has a first step that is the direct projection onto the qubit base, but then you have a lot of terms, and this term are a series that take into account that your qubit can interact, these two states go up, and then they can go back uh, again. So when you take into account this interaction, you find that these terms, roughly speaking, some of them at least, they would go as the amplitude to go up for qubit, qubit, go up to the excited state and come back. And this amplitude, if you take this as a rough approximation of a harmonic potential, it is going to be, uh, typically h bar omega q, which is the distance, and then this is going to be one. So we have to sum the full series, okay? For the qubit resonator, it's not that bad because indeed you have the square root of one qubit and the resonator, but this is much smaller than the difference between the, uh, uh, the qubit superspace and high excited state. Here, I am thinking that you have a large anharmonicity, so this separation is large but it could be the case for three Josephson junction qubits. Now, we uh, go back. So, summing up the full series, we did something similar. Uh, we improved the, oh, this doesn't work, the work of Ponsani and Warburton. Well, uh, we based on their method, we did a, another method that I think that it is a bit better. And uh, all of this is based on the work of this other reference. And what we did numerically is to sum up the full series. And we have that in this region, we have the qubit gap, that is this one. We have the coupling here and the coupling here that are similar. We have something like this model because sigma y, y and sigma z, uh, z, z are similar as 0 0.5, uh, 0 0.1 something like this, so we have this type of, of model, which is not a full sigma x, x, y, y, but still is something that is not in one direction. And we have the qubit gap that is of the same order, the amplitude. So we have, uh, well, this model was explained, it, uh, roughly explained it in this reference, why you are going to have this one, but we are able to, so, to compute from zero that you are going to have as y, y in the first order to this model, and also we are able to show that there is quite a strong coupling for this, yes. And also with our theory, you can get an intuitive explanation of why they start to be more, more coupling, 
So the first order, as I was talking, is that you have a qubit, qubit, they interact, but they stay in the qubit. Now the second order is qubit, qubit, they go up and they go down. And this gives you a sigma set set that is indeed the second order here. And then you have uh, these two process that you can join it and you have a sigma x. So you have always j x, x that is non-zero. <sighs> ah, and last for this, uh, if we uh, join it also with a Josephson Jackson that can be made tunable, this is more or less straightforward and we show it in this paper that you can build this type of models with sigma x, x, with the Josephson Junction and also the sigma plus, sigma plus, sigma minus, sigma minus. And this is non-stochastic in principle. At least the spin model is non-stochastic and it is also, we are able to show that it's uh, non-stochastic and very strong coupling. Okay, this is uh, the case that it was more simple. Here, this is the qubit and the resonator. Join it, qubit and resonator. And what happens here is that, as I said, the first order works and things are much simple. And what you can show is in this plot, you have the coupling of the qubit versus the gap of the qubit. This is this line and the coupling of the, res uh, the coupling respect the, uh, the energy of the resonator. And what happens is that at some point, there is this point that omega r, the, the energy of the resonator and the one of the gap is the same. And at this point, you can explore a model that has the same energy for qubit, for resonator, and also the coupling is ultra strong because we reach point of 0 0.15. So again, adding the magnetic coupling, we can show something that is, I think that has not been studied in superconducting circuit, that is the qubit, the resonator, and an ultra strong coupling in two directions. And this open, I think that this open new regime of quantum optics. Okay, now. With this, I finished with the three Josephson Jackson arrays. All of this was for, for three Josephson Jackson arrays, although I think that it can be made for other type of persistent carrying uh, qubits. Mm -hmm. Can you say again what, the what are the no, parameters? Sorry, Denis. <laughs> can, can you say again uh, what are the parameters you have to tune to switch on and off the couplings to the resonators and between qubits? Well, for the uh, for this one, this you can make it like uh, an square. This is and for the resonator. Uh, for the resonator, I think uh, well, for the resonator, in principle, is uh, is this uh, is fixed by construction, but this is also fixed by construction. So yes, we should. At some point, we were trying to get this coupling also because it is not nice that this is fixed by construction. But so you have in mind a stimulator, not an annealer, because with this you cannot make annealing. Yes, yes, yes. You have to get the tunable uh, capacitor. But the point here is that we want to, well, before doing this, we have to see if this works for something or not. So we have these two papers uh, saying that non stochastic is cured going to the superconducting circuit. And then we have to see first of developing more these ideas and do everything like tunable. We have to see if this is going to work or not. Because if you spend a lot of time and then they come with the quantum Monte Carlo and they say, okay, I can do it uh, in the full superconducting circuit. This is not going to be, well, it is worth that it's going to be for now. <laughs> okay. uh, how much time do I have? Oh, no, I'm going without that. Yes, now. And now I'm going to change a bit. Well, I mean, it is more or less the same. Uh, we have, a, we want to study also new models. That is how to implement a peak, a bound state in the continuum in a fluxonium q -trip. Now it's a Q-trip. The qubit is two level, q is three level. Okay, uh, coupled to a microwave waveguide. Okay, so let me say, two words about what is a bound state in the continuum. A bound state in the continuum can be explained with this picture that I took it from this reference. So they were first predicted a very long time ago by von Neumann and Wigner. Wigner. And what happens is that in principle, if you think in a quantum system, you can have, you have the spectrum of the quantum system and you can have different type of spectrum. You, ha you have the discrete spectrum, typically at low energies, and then 
what happened is that this is a confined state. You put it, the particle here, it is and it is confined in the, in the space. Okay. Now you go to the continuum. Typically, the continuum of, if you are in the continuum, the state are not going to be localized. They are going to be extended. You can have a weak resonance. That it means that the particle can stay more time here, or it is concentrated here, but still it can leak and go to the infinite, to infinite. And then you have a big. A big is a mode that lives, lies in the continuum part of a spectrum, but is completely localized like a discrete state. And this is some, from the point of view of theory and also from the technological application, this is an interesting state. So uh, this state has been mm, extensively uh, analyzed in the, in the framework of photonic, I would say, but also there has been a couple of some works in superconducting sequence, the one that I'm aware, uh, better aware is this one and this one. And those work, what they did is to construct a big from, a, from, the, uh, from the field in the, localize it in the uh, waveguide. So the bad thing of this, and they use the qubit, they use the a qubit in some way to put the correct boundary condition. But then uh, the big is, yes, it's localized in this part of the, of the waveguide, but it's not so compact because it can be localized in a, in a big part of the waveguide. What we are going to try is to do a more compact, to localize it even in the fluxonium loop, that is a much smaller region of the system, and also with the hope that it's scalable to do applications. Okay, the system that I'm going to analyze now, and for which we have been working, is something like this. You have a coplanar wave waveguide. Uh, you couple to here, capacitively again, to something that is a fluxonium. Here you have, well, the fluxonium has been introduced in this, uh, this morning a couple of times. So uh, you have the large inductance that you have to set here, as Joan was saying. And uh, this is the original paper where they uh, propose the fluxonium and the analysis just this system. And where are we having in this system? We have a dark state. In principle, we have a dark state. What happens if you write the potential of the fluxonium at the zero bias, at zero external, uh, external magnetic flux, Treating the loop, you find this type of potential energy. Now, you can put the zero state here, the minus one state here, and one state here. We are interested in the Q3. We are interested in to keep these three states. So, uh, what happens is that if you are a zero bias, you are going to have the superposition. The first state is this one, more or less, and the second state is the superposition because this and this are, they generate the superposition, uh, the symmetric and anti symmetric superposition of do those two states. That is plus minus. Now, in this case, we have a uh, flux inversion symmetry. So this means that the states uh, have a well-defined parity and the operator have well-defined parity. This is very basic. So you cannot join with the charge that is given by this operator, this, this coupling. You cannot join the ground state to another one that has the same parity because the charge has odd parity. And then you are not going to go from here to here. So what happens is that this is that. And this, you get, uh, a wave here, you try to excite from the zero to this uh, plus superposition and you cannot do it. This is that. And this has been experimentally seen in the, pre in the, uh, in the original work here as a bit in the transmission, in, in the spectroscopy. So this is the first level, the qubit level, and this is the second level. And they don't see that the signal as zero flux bias. Okay, so is this a big? Well, it doesn't need to be a big. Why not? Because uh, you have a dark state, but if you put the state here in the big, in the second, it can go away. It can go away. How? Well, it can decay, decay from plus to minus. So we need to suppress this transition. So if we, need, if we su suppress this transition, that this is a thing that can be done going to this regime of EJ over EC, we are going to have some sort of a big. This is going to be more localized. And then here we have the transition rate from plus to minus in the scale of milliseconds, uh, of seconds, inverse of second, the frequency. And we effect, we see that the tendency is that w when you increase Ej over Ec, this is the renormalized Ec, but it's a detail that we don't care now. Uh, when you start to increase this ratio, you see that there is an exponential decrease of this transition rate, which means that the decay type roughly also increases exponentially with this quantity. And then, uh, well, this, 
decrease is up to a point, and this point is where there is a void in level crossing between the plus state and the third uh, uh, sighted state, phi. So we want to avoid to have this avoid in level crossing soon. What we do to do uh, to make this is to set a large ej over el, which is anyway the regime of the of the fluxonium, and with this we can see that there are huge decay in time or transition rate is very very small. So in principle, this thing that we have a uh, bit in a flu in the fluxonium, Q trip in the fluxonium, Q trip at least. So, but those huge uh, decay in time are, are, are realistic. Probably you are, that many of you are experimental. You are going to say, as the previous speaker was saying, yes, in theory, you can do whatever you want, but in the practice, probably not. So uh, there is going to be a noise. Uh, what happened with the noise? In principle, there is going to be a standard sort of noise that is that you can uh, uh, bias the system with noise and then the matter is that the sensitivity of this type of transition from zero to plus is very large. And if you bias the system, you are going to, and for a long time, you are going to allow this transition to occur and you are not going to have a peak anymore. Well, uh, however, yeah. we have, uh, in some way, we have to put here numbers and estimate what is the noise level and we have done this by computing the, the typical deviation of, uh, of the flux for very long time, so at the cutoff of a smaller frequencies, and we can set a uh, noise for the one over f noise at very large, at very small frequencies that is in this level. So if it is in this level, the big could be realized experimentally, at least taking into account this one over f flux noise. If it is 10 to the minus five, we are going to have a transition rate in seconds, in the inverse of second to 10 to the four, which is quite huge, quite a lot, I, I think. Uh, well, not, I mean, the, the inverse is going to be uh, quite a lot compared with the typical frequencies of, this, of the system, at least. And we have here a flux noise level here. We are going to have decaying time up to milliseconds. And this is consistent with the decaying time coming from the plus to minus transition that I was saying before. Uh, so for this, for example, for this realization, for this parameter, if the noise is in this level, we don't see any problem to have this order of time for the decay, and that seems to be very large also. You can always say, well, you have to take into account other sources of noise. At least we think that for the dielectric losses, it is also fine. This we have taken into account. Okay, and now uh, a couple of remarks about this peak. Uh, this peak is very, you, we expect that you can construct in a way that is very well uh, protected from decay, but then it's very well protected from being created, uh, which is very unpleasant. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have to think in ways how to create it. And well, we can think in some, some procedure like here, trying to decide with non-linearities, but we are also thinking something very simple, which is to put a small bias populate the big and then go to the zero bias. This is mm, probably not ideal from the point of view of quantum, or quantum information because in this regime of a small bias, you are not protected from the point of view of quantum information. So the phasing and all this stuff can come. But at least for the point of view of creating the big, I think that it would work. And also uh, we have to take into account that the heavier, the more heavy the fluxonium is, in this curve that I was showing before, the sensibility is much larger. So we can do this in a fast way by setting an EJ over EC large. However, this always uh, would come to a larger also sensitivity to the noise, which may be also dangerous. And these are the conclusions. I think that we have expanded the family of, of model that you can set, with, that you can uh, implement with current, persistent current qubits, and specifically for a three Joseph injection qubit, we have seen that we can do a ultra strong and non-stochastic model with the qubit-qubit interaction. And for the qubit resonator, we have shown that there is ultra strong coupling in two directions, which is something that has been unexplored, I think, up to date. In, at least in superconducting circuits. 
for the Crypsonian Q3, uh, we have seen that it may be realizable to construct a very long lived state, a big state, bound state in the continuum. And now we are also thinking in what to do next, which can be uh, see if we can get the universal quantum computer, the model that I was talking at the beginning with two uh, orthogonal couplings, or also think in the application of the big for quantum information and also for sensing, because it is very, very sensitive to the external field. Uh, well, one thing that I didn't say is that this the results from this Fluxonium Q3, we will put it uh, today or tomorrow in the archive, so we, it is not available yet. These two, the references are in the main body of the work. You can check it if you like. And that's all, thank you. Thank you very much. The talk is now open for questions. You mentioned uh, the effect of 1 over f noise. Uh, I suppose it's flux noise. And how did you estimate this I didn't get? Or are you just uh, supposing it's there? No, we estimate it well. We get from the experimental work uh, of Manucharian in 2019 at PRX that they say that the model is a flux noise they take it as a constant a, a over omega over omega with a 10 to the minus 5 uh, 10 to the minus 6 this is the spectrum roughly speaking and it's supposed that this is consistent this power spectrum is consistent with the experimental result you have also to set a, a cutoff, and I think that the cutoff in the frequency, we put it the plus cutoff, we put that 10 to the 2, second, uh, 1 over second, 1 over second, uh, and gamma minus to the high energy cutoff, 10 to the 3, or something like this. Uh, this was uh, this was consistent with previous work, and then we compute long long time fluctuations. Okay, no, the question was, what are you calculating and now? Yes, so. Uh, uh, well, we do these computations okay. up to, with typical times that they are near the this cutoff, this is the, this cutoff, very slow noise. Okay. And this gives you an idea, I think, that the amplitude of this computation, the because this is the well, this is the external, the external, yes. Uh, well, you will take the no, real no, part okay. of this. It's clear. Yeah. Thank you. We have time for one more question. I would have a question actually. So it's uh, regarding the first part of your talk. You mentioned that uh, you could have um, ultra strong coupling in two directions, and that it could may give rise to new physics. Could you elaborate? Maybe? Yes, uh, well, actually, we didn't get uh, two directions, sigma x, sigma x, sigma y, sigma y, uh, for qubit, qubit coupling. But w you were referring to the qubit. Uh, qubit uh, yeah, yeah, I didn't mind, like, yes. multi-channel spin boson or stuff like that. Yeah, with the qubit resonator, I think that you may be able to do a James Cummings model, but usually, if I'm not mistaken, this James Cummings model came from the rotating wave approximation, and then you are uh, always constrained to small to small values. So you cannot go to James Cummings model with a ultra strong coupling. And but with this, you can do it. You can go to very strong coupling because we are showing that we have a strong coupling. So it's in some way it's physics. That's all. Okay. Thank you. So let's thank Manuel again. <laughs> so the last talk.